Good evening, everybody. My name is Ian Donahue. I am the president of the board of directors for the Barrington Land Conservation Trust. And uh, welcome to our event tonight. Thanks for coming. Uh, my job is to introduce our guest tonight. But first, I would like to acknowledge the person who has put all this together. And that is Cindy Elder, the executive director of the Barrington Land Conservation Trust. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy envisioned this entire series, but more importantly, she brought it into existence with her own two hands. Uh, she's been great, and we really appreciate it. It's been a big success so far, and we're looking forward to more of these in the future. Thanks, Cindy. At the Land Trust, we focus on protecting and caring for natural open spaces and educating the public about these resources. I'm glad you joined us today, either in person or virtually, and I hope you will support our work as a volunteer or a contributor. You can learn more and get involved at blct.org. We're grateful to the Barrington Public Library and their staff for partnering with us on the learning series. Thanks also to our presenting sponsor, Chart House Realtors, and all the great sponsors who made it possible for us to offer these events to the public at no charge. Tonight, we'll hear from Alex Kuffner, who has spent decades reporting on the most serious environmental issues of our time with the Providence Journal. He's also a neighbor, a Barrington resident, who enjoys walking at St. Andrew's Farm. I understand his wife, Lisa, recently identified a rare world milkweed plant in their own backyard. Alex earned a bachelor's degree in East Asian studies and a master's degree in journalism, both from Columbia University. Among his many accolades, Alex won the silver award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science for a story on coastal erosion and a first place award from the Society of Environmental Journalists for articles on an invasive species of stinging jellyfish in Rhode Island waters, a scourge of tree killing insects and a drought that defoliated portions of Rhode Island's forests in the expansive growth of solar farms in the state. That's just giving the surface of issues Alex has tackled that directly affect us here in our home state and beyond. Tonight's event will begin with a Q&A with Alex and Land Trust Executor, Executive Director Cindy Elder. Then we'll take your questions. Thank you for coming and please help me welcome Alex Kuffner. everybody. The thing I've been most nervous about this whole time is pressing that button for the screen. Stage right. It was very exciting. So uh, really happy to be here with you, Alex, and with our friends here. And we're going to take some, we're going to, am I uh, feeding back at all, Siobhan? We're good. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask Alex some questions and then we're going to throw it out to you. And we'll see how much ground we can cover in an hour. Um, so, Alex, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, really appreciate it. And so, you know, when we think about um, reporters, you know, well-known reporters that we read in the newspaper, and uh, we we don't always think about the road that led them to that path of actually doing this type of work. Did you have experiences in your youth, or perhaps mentors who pointed you in this direction? so that you would end up doing this type of work? Um, I think for other writers, it's a linear path maybe. So, you know, getting to where they are for me, it wasn't. Um, as I think Ian said, and you know, when he introduced me, I, I majored in, um, well, Chinese history and political science in college. I spent a lot of time in China and I thought that's where I was gonna end up working. And then um, went to work for an international law firm in Hong Kong and thought I was gonna become a lawyer. Um, and all the lawyers there told me not to do it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I started freelancing uh, at the time and I fell in love with journalism. Uh, eventually made my way to doing some environmental reporting and mainly started, um, I got a fellowship to go to India and I reported on a, a water shortage crisis there. Um, they were this is sort of a couple decades ago when people were first talking about, you know, the wars of the future will be fought over water. Um, and, you know, there were skirmishes in India at the time where 
Um, this one story that I focused on was about um, farmers who were protesting uh, a city that was taking, you know, water from the underground well aquifer. Um, and there were actually some uh, protests in which the police fired on the on the protesters and killed some farmers. So I reported on that. Um, and just after that sort of, you know, that sort of built, you know, I, I, I started doing more environmental reporting after that. And um, at the journal, we had this, you know, terrific long time environmental reporter. His name was Peter Lord. If you guys have been around yeah. long enough, you know Pete. Mm -hmm. um, and he really mentored me. Um, and he uh, died prematurely uh, about a decade ago. And, um, you know, I've pretty more or less been, you know, covering the environment, um, you know, since then. I was doing a lot before that too on renewable energy. Um, but yeah, I mean, Pete, and then actually another one of the speakers that you guys are gonna have in, um, I think next month, John Castreva, who writes the Walking Rhode Island column. He was my editor at the journal. So he was someone else who mentored me. He's a great guy. He's a terrific guy. Yeah. Terrific yeah. guy. We used to, I mean, we, we, a great editor. Yeah, we butted heads all the time. So <laughs> he, was a, he was a great editor, yeah. Right, and he's someone I think who also, um, I, I would say he's a journalist, journalist, journalist. Yes. Yeah. Uh, someone who really cares about the craft. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, you know, when you when you think about um, what journalism has gone through in the last decade or so, it's gone through some some growing pains. I think some might say it's gone through some shrinking pains yeah. because, you know, the people keep decrying, you know, the, the death of journalism. But you're really known for your in-depth pieces for long form journalism, which isn't something we see everywhere. And we're really lucky in Rhode Island that I think we have um, an organization that's still supporting uh, that kind of deep investigation of environmental issues. Um, do you know why the journal commits that kind of time and resources to this form of journalism? I don't know why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, when, so when, when, so the journal had, a, has had a reputation for a long time as being a writer's paper. Um, and that made sense uh, when we were privately owned by the Metcalf family, when they could pour money into the paper where the profits weren't the sort of the all important sort of, you know, driver behind, you know, doing these stories. Um, when I joined the paper, this is 23, almost 24 years ago, um, you know, we were already cutting staff at that point, but there were still over 200 reporters in the newsroom. Now there's 15 of us. Um, so why they let, I, I think, I think they let me do it because there's an, there is this, this legacy that Pete and other people have left of doing good environmental journalism in Rhode Island. Um, and I think they value that. I think that they, they recognize, um, that, you know, climate change is an important issue, um, that it's going to become more important. So they want someone there that has some expertise. It's not something that you can parachute in, or at least I don't think that you can parachute in and just cover it without any, any sort of background. So I think that's one of the reasons they do it. Um, beyond that, it's, yeah, it's yeah. hard, it's hard for me to say. Yeah. When you're writing, do you have this hypothetical reader in mind? Is, is there, are, are you thinking about, well, how, you know, how do I expand this audience? So who, who, Who's at the other end? Who's you know? I can tell you, I'm at the other end because I'm. We are that person who actually gets the newspaper delivered every day. Yeah. And I think I, I told you when we first met that um, in our household, um, we have uh, a pecking order on the newspaper. My husband has to have first touch of the newspaper, and uh, then I get I get it second. And when our kids were around, they they got it third. But it gets pretty well read. Uh, but when you think about, you know, who's your reader? Do you who is that person out there in Rhode Island? I I don't know. I mean, um, yeah, all of you guys. I mean, it's hard for me to say. I I write I write the way that I write things that I would want to read. You know. Yep. Um, and I think that that's that can be a detriment sometimes because I like long things. I like in depth things. I like the things that are complex. So. I think sometimes maybe my stuff doesn't get as many readers as other things that we do. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm 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 editing a story or working on a story right now that's either running this Sunday or next Sunday. Um, it's you know 
considered long for the paper. So it was three and a half thousand words. And um, I was going through it and, you know, an editor was trying to introduce sort of things into the story to make it more, you know, reader friendly, you know, to read online. Um, and I went back and after all his changes, I, I don't know if I should be saying this, you know, but after all, <laughs> he made all these changes, but then I went back and I, I changed it all back to the way I wanted it because I just, I, I don't know. I want to, if, if I'm writing a narrative, I want it to read like as a, as a narrative. I don't want to have like tabs or bullet points or anything in my story. So I don't know if that's smart or not, but. Um, well, I, I do you know. think that when I look at the, the kind of articles you've written, they're the kind of thing that I refer back to uh, over time. Mm -hmm. and, and so they, be, you know, when they become a reference piece, the person who's using them for reference is really glad that you took the time to write the big long story and not just the headline. I think we see enough headlines and it doesn't give us that kind of depth. And I that love that. Need. I mean, I, I, I wrote a, a, a big piece about salt marshes and how we're losing salt marshes. And, you know, I was contacted by a, a teacher who wanted to use it in their classroom. Mm -hmm. If you go down to the to the boardwalk at Audubon, uh, uh, one of the graphics from that story is on the boardwalk there sort of showing and it sort of shows how, you know, the marsh is degrading down there and, you know, that to me, like, I, I love seeing that. Yeah, you know. fantastic. So, so when, um, when you're writing an article, um, I mean, I've done some writing myself, but I, I often think it's like, it's like cooking a Thanksgiving dinner and, you know, you spend days and days and days working on it and then, then people just gobble it up in 15 minutes. Um, but they don't really know what the process is that goes into some of these big research articles that you do. Can you tell me, just, you know, or give me an example of uh, a little bit of how you do your work. And I also do just want to ask, is there anyone here who is an aspiring journalist? Oh, good. Be any of the, the young people over here? Okay. Okay. Because I, I love to hear about how folks do their work. And so what's your process? Yes, there's a couple. I mean, sometimes you spend an inordinate amount of time doing the reporting. Sometimes it's, it's you know, more time on the writing. Um, when I, I wrote about, so, you know, you may be, some of you may be familiar with the fact that we're getting a lot of these big um, solar farms, mainly in the western part of the state, um, western southern part of the state, where developers are tearing down forests in order to build solar ground mounted solar arrays. Um, so, you know, uh, there was no, there was no central, there's no central clearinghouse in the state that's tracking like how many of these projects are being built. Um, National Grid at the time, they knew it was in the pipeline, but that was, you know, private information. So, you know, I was having to call, you know, every single city in town to find out, you know, uh, you know, what what developments were, were or what proposals were in development um, and also just talk to them about their about their zoning laws. So that just took a ton of time. Um, when as far as writing goes, um, you know, I write sometimes about obscure things, um, but I want them to be interesting to a general reader. So I wrote this, I wrote a series a couple of years ago on, um, on the winter flounder, which is a fish that used to be, you know, ubiquitous in the bay. People used to say that the bay was paved with winter flounder. They were everywhere. Um, and now, you know, you'll be lucky, you know, to find, to catch, you know, one or two of them anywhere. Um, and that's, it's a result of climate change, but it's a really sort of complicated, the, the reasons behind the loss are sort of complicated. It all comes back to temperature, but it's got to do with new predators coming into Rhode Island from, you know, more Southern waters. It's got to do with, um, existing predators that, that have sort of changed the, um, the timing of when they come into the bay. Um, there are lots of things going on, but, um, you know, you're doing sort of a, a series uh, on a fish like that, like if you're a fisherman or if you're a scientist or a regulator, maybe you'll want to read that. But if you're a regular person, you know, maybe not. So, you know, it, it ended up being like eight or nine thousand words on this on this one fish. Like I spent so much time trying to just like, you know, make the fish like relatable. Right. Like what do you when you want to read about the winter flounder? How is the winter flounder interesting? You know, um, and um I mean, I, I, I reread the story actually because well, I was preparing for this today. So I reread the story and I was like, oh, that was a pretty good story. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just things like that are really difficult. Yeah, know, sure. Well, and I think one of the things it points to is that 
the information that you're providing in the newspaper, it's not, um, it, there isn't some repository where all that information lives. You have, actually have to go out and dig it right. up right. from a lot of different sources. Right. And it always makes me think that if we didn't have people doing this kind of work, how, how much more at risk we would be for all of these environmental situations that are going on because somebody's got to be on the ball and looking after these things and digging into it. Um, so when, when you, you, you mentioned like, you know, some of these obscure things you've written about this enormous range of environmental topics you've covered. Um, can you tell us about a story maybe earlier in your career where it, it, it foreshadowed some of the big challenges around climate change and sea level rise that, that we're seeing now? I think the 2010 floods, yeah. for sure. I think when we, when, when that happened, and you know, I, I wrote a, a big takeout afterwards, six months afterwards, about you know, when we had more perspective about what had happened, and um, you know, even just writing about the cleanup, and then writing about how there were certain neighborhoods in Cranston where they, they were you know, talking about buying out houses because they were in the floodplain. Um, they were all things, you know, at the time, we, we, you know, we still call them like the historic floods of 2010. Um, and I think they're described as, you know, between a 500 year and a, and a thousand year event. So a 500 year event is something that could happen. It's like a, a two tenths of a percent chance of happening in any year, you know? Um, so at the time it was just like, okay, an extraordinary event, that's it. Now, obviously we haven't seen anything like that since then, but this like pretty much over the past year, starting you know with the uh, um, the floods we saw that closed down ninety five um, last Labor Day, so a year ago, Labor Day of a year ago, and then you know we've had several you know extreme rain events this year. I start thinking more that you know these are the, these extreme downpours are what we're going to be seeing you know more and more often. Um, this is an El Nino year, so it's it's hard to say whether this is sort of the new normal, but definitely like there have just been several events. And I can even go back, you know, a year before that, when the remnants of Hurricane Ida came through and we saw severe flooding in Warren around Belcher's Cove. Um, and there were several homes that flooded there. There was one that actually was condemned. Um, so, you know, just off the top of my head, that's, you know, there was like five, there's like five, six events within a two year period where I, I remember there, that yeah. flood in Warren well because my car was parked at Twigs Automotive. So yeah. <laughs> and Twigs, right, exactly. And they, and yeah. it was flooded up to the door. Yeah. Yeah. I know that they were moving they were moving cars off that lot, but they couldn't get I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. No, it it was bad. And yeah. and I you know, I know that a lot of communities are really suddenly looking at this in, in in it must be so interesting for you because you've been following these issues over time. Mm -hmm. And so you see these incremental changes. Um it, it must be a little scary, I would think, in some ways. Well again, I you know, hopefully this year is an anomaly, but it doesn't feel incremental um in terms of the downpours now. And the data is showing us that, right? So you know, we used to have an average uh of eight. I think eight one inch rainstorms a year now, and this is going back a century. Now we have 14 in a year. Um, when you look at like the the biggest downpours we'd see in a calendar year, it would be, you know, two and a half inches and in it would average two and a half inches in that downpour. Now it's three and a half, um, you know, just this year alone. Um, I think so far we've had 38 inches of rain in Rhode Island, 19 inches have come in one inch rain events. So that half our rainfall is coming in downpours. So it, it's, you know, we're getting, um, you know, rain is becoming more segregated in sort of the spring and fall. Again, th this, this year, again, is a little bit different, but, and, and we're getting more of it in downpours rather than gradually, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, so switching gears a little bit, yeah. um, it, it is no secret that we live in a very polarized country where people sometimes decide that they wanna have their own set of facts. Um, and, and definitely we've seen this happen in environmental debates. When you're writing, <clears throat> do you are you conscious about trying to sort of reach across differences in ideology to educate people about the challenges we face um, you know, are there stories where you've had to juggle this kind of polarized thinking? 
Yeah, so obviously anytime we're writing about climate change, that happens. Um, the, the nature of sort of that, that, um, that push and pull has changed a little bit. So uh, 10 years ago, like I, I was qualifying a lot more what I was saying. There was a lot of according to scientists. And then, you know, you get pushback from people that say, saying that climate change wasn't happening. Then it evolved to, you know, the, 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 the people on the other side of it were saying, well, climate change is happening, but it's not, you know, caused by, you know, human activities. Um, and oftentimes now it's, um, you know, people acknowledge, okay, there is climate change, we are contributing to it, but, um, you know, it's not worth, you know, doing anything about it right now with renewable energy or anything like that. It's too expensive. We're going to engineer our way out of it, you know, later on. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep that stuff in mind as I'm writing, but I'm not, again, as opposed to 10, 15 years ago, where, you know, I felt like I would have to acknowledge some of the counter arguments. I'm not doing it as much now. Um, the other issue where there is a ton of controversy, um, obviously related to climate change is offshore wind. And this is what we're seeing a ton of here on Rhode Island. Um, and uh, in that debate, you know, there are a lot of legitimate positions. There's a lot of legitimate opposition. Um, I think the concerns over the effect on the ocean floor, on um, fisheries, um, the, the, the objections from fishermen themselves, I think there's, there's a lot of legitimate concerns there. Um, but then there are so many other things sort of mixed up in this that um, there's no evidence of, and I, and I, I'm not going to address a lot of that. I just can't, you know. Um, and yeah, they're, they're just yeah. But, really but the wind energy yeah. is a really tricky one because yeah. I think that um, I, I certainly want wind to work. Yeah, and I want that to be an effective source of energy and yet when you do think about all the different the different stakeholders the you know the manufacturers the fishermen the energy producers the yeah, regulators yeah. the customers the people who may not actually like looking at it out their back window um i mean there are so many stakeholders and there are probably as you mentioned there's some legitimate concerns that they have and i it's always very frustrating to me um because I, I have to open my mind to say, all right, I really want wind to work, but some of these folks may have legitimate concerns. For sure. And and are there any of those concerns that you that have you have found to be compelling? Well, yeah, I mean there are there are a lot that I find compelling. I mean, yeah, you know, I mentioned the fisheries and the fishermen. I, I find those very compelling concerns. I mean, if you're a fisherman and you fish in these these waters for so long, and I'm just talking about just like um just in terms of their livelihood, how do you how do you navigate, you know, I think there's a lot of fear about navigating through these wind farms, even though there's a lot of spacing between the turbines. Um, if there's bad weather, you know, if, if it's foggy, if the seas are rough, like they are legitimately scared about, you know, what's going to happen trying to get their, their boats through, through the wind farms. I think that's completely le legitimate. Um, when you're pile driving into the ocean floor, when you're putting wind turbines in really sensitive and really, really important habitat like Cox Ledge, which is in Rhode Island Sound. It's known as an incredibly important fish nursery. That's one of the, the last places in Southern New England where we're seeing, um, you know, cod, Atlantic cod that are still spawning, um, you know, and you're pile driving into the, the waters around there. I think, yeah, like, like there, there could be some, some impacts. Um, the problem is that you know, the only wind farm that we have, um, you know, in America, essentially, there's, I mean, there's a couple turbines down off the coast of Virginia, but otherwise it's Block Island Wind Farm, that's five turbines. Um, it's, it's so small that, you know, that's not um, a great, you know, you can't sit there and say that Block Island, you know, what happened with Block Island is going to test the example for the rest of the, the, the waters off southern New England. So I think that, yeah, there are tons of uh, fears. That being said, um, like, so you hear a lot these days about how, you know, development of wind farms is killing whales. Um, if you talk to any marine mammal expert out there, they're going to say that there's no evidence of that. 
So, um, you know, I think there are a lot of issues that get caught up in this debate and they get mixed up in things. And um, there's, it may turn out, you know, at some point that there's truth to these things, but at this point, we just don't know. It, it's one of the reasons why I feel like so, it's so important to have journalists who are continuing to write about it because a lot of this is, is uh, it, everything is not known yet. Right. And so we have to just keep peeling back the layers of the onion. The other, the other thing I just want to, so if I can, yeah. right? And, and we can talk about this, you know, I just want to, in, in a broader point, there is no perfect form of energy out there, right? So, you know, it, you develop a natural gas fire power plant, yet the emissions are going to be lower than coal, but there are still emissions. There's leaks, you know, there are methane leaks. Um, nuclear, you know, we all know, you know, about, about nuclear. Um, solar, right? So, so if you're if you're talking, you know, in particular about the, these big um, solar farms, right? Not just here in Rhode Island, they're in Massachusetts or wherever, right? Where you're taking down forests, right? If you're talking just about carbon, right? It, it's, it's a no brainer, tear down the forest, honestly, because whatever, whatever power you generate from solar is it, it's worth it. it it's more, you're going to, you're going to save on, on the carbon, or you're going to reduce your carbon footprint um, to a greater extent than whatever carbon is stored in that forest. But there are so many attributes to the forest, you know, that that's going to make you want to save that forest. It's not, it doesn't come down to, to carbon. But I'm just saying that, that like, when we talk about optional wind, like to have this idea that it is going to be this perfect thing that's going to save us. I mean, it, it's not, there's going to be drawbacks, right. no matter what. Right. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, you know, one of the things you've written about um, these forever chemicals, and I'm going to try and say the actual word, yeah. per and polyfluoral alcohol, alcohol yes. substances yeah. Yeah. known as PFAS, yeah. right? Yeah. That's the easy way. Um, but those, that this is one of those issues where it feels like the ground keeps shifting beneath our feet as we, we're struggling to understand them better. And I'm wondering, where do you see this issue going in the next few years? I think just more and more regulation. Yeah. Um, I, we're seeing it already that, um, you know, when I first started reporting on this about well, six, seven years ago, um, the EPA had these recommendations that you couldn't have, you know, greater than, you know, 70 parts per trillion. Um you know, uh, sort of uh, concentrations of PFAS chemicals in your water. Um, in Rhode Island, we've adopted these rules that they you can't have greater than 20. Um, and now the EPA is proposing rules that are even lower than that. Um, and I think it's going to keep going down and down and down because they're finding that there's no level of these chemicals that, that are safe, that, you know, any sort of trace amount um, could, you know, if you ingest enough of them could have, um, you know, health impacts. We're finding them in water, we're finding them in, obviously in food packaging. They found them uh, in the air we breathe, so in indoor air. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I think we're just gonna see more and more regulation. Does this affect the way you live your life at all? Are you uh, concerned about, you know, products that you mm -hmm. use or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. Um, I am, I think about it all the time, but I mean, there are certain things that we don't even know that, that they're in, right. right. Um, you know, but you, you know, you got to take away a container, uh, a food container. And if it's got like a glossy sort of surface, you know, that, that could easily be PFAS there because that's what they're used for is, is to repel, you know, oil and, um, and, you know, fats. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it must be hard to know so much about this stuff. That, yeah. you know, it, it, it's got to be a little stressful. There's a, you, yeah, there's a UI professor that I asked about this. I asked him the exact same question. I said, knowing that what you know about this, aren't you like looking everywhere you go? Aren't you seeing this stuff? And he said he is you know, yeah. everywhere, everything. Because yeah. yeah. on, you know, your raincoat, right? Um, right. It could be on anything. Right. Popcorn bags. I mean, not anymore. I think most of them, they face that out. But yeah, yeah. microwave popcorn bags. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, some of the issues you write about, like like the noxious odors coming from the Woonsocket wastewater treatment plant, they seem to point toward environmental justice issues. Have you found that environmental transgressions are occurring more frequently in lower income communities and communities of color? Yeah, I think so. Um, 
mean, I just had a, a story this past Sunday um, on air pollution and, um, you know, the what, what air monitoring, you know, we are doing in Rhode Island is finding that, you know, pollution levels are higher um, in neighborhood, you know, low, low income neighborhoods, you know, the area uh, around the Port of Providence, neighborhoods around, you know, Route 95. Um, you know, and it's not just um, air quality, it, you know, those are areas with older housing stock. Um, so, you know, you still have lead paint issues uh, around there. You still have issues with um, lead water lines, service lines. So the mains on the street have largely all been replaced, um, but not the service lines going to the houses. And that's because um, to replace those lines, like, you know, there is some funding out there for households, but otherwise, you know, individual people have to pay for that themselves. And if you can't afford that, then, you know, that stays there. So, yeah, I mean. Right, so while fun. many of us are maybe worrying about PFAS in our you know, microwave popcorn, um, yeah. there are a lot of folks who are still worrying about lead pipes. For sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we, and the lead paint too, I mean, you know, I think we, we think that, Maybe that's not as much of an issue anymore. That that was something that that you know you know one there was a big lawsuit um, 20, 25 years ago. I think uh, I can't remember the dates now, but we tend to think a lot of the stuff is in is in the past. But you know it takes so long to clean up some of these things to address the problem because you know talking we're talking about lead paint in houses. You're talking about you know individual houses, right? Um, and a lot of them are in rental property. So how do you get right. landlords to take care of the problem? Right. Yeah. 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 And and if there isn't a, an incentive or a, a you know or or a real penalty. Correct. Yeah. 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 Um, so you know, I think for a lot of us, the climate change is is that big monster behind the door right now that it's it's not hiding anymore. It's showing its face and it's it's out there. And you know, even though scientists have been screaming about this for for years, um, it feels like the conversation is shifting from preventing climate change to uh, to dealing with climate change because because that ship has sailed. Mm -hmm. You know, it is it is uh, it is happening. Uh, what do you think are going to be the hot topics, so to speak, uh, pun intended, around climate change in in the years to come? Uh, so, as I mentioned before, I think like inland flooding from downpours. Um, if that's something that I'm thinking about more and more now. Um, coastal flooding, I've, I've written about a lot. I think coastal flooding actually in a way is easier to, to deal with because you know if it's if it's sea level, driven by sea level rise, it's somewhat predictable. It gives you have some time, right? Um, and I and I do think that even though you know we're in a northeastern state where maybe the temperatures aren't as extreme as in the southwest. Um, I think heat, um, you know, I've written a lot or done a lot of reporting on this um, this summer. I've got a, a story uh, coming out. Oh, this is the story I was mentioning before um, in a week or two, um, looking at uh, specifically at, at, at uh, energy bills. So, you know, how do you deal with higher um, electric costs caused by, you know, you need more air conditioning. And if you're sort of a you're a poor person, how do you afford those costs? Um, so I think that heat is gonna be an issue. Like we have these neighborhoods, um, Pawtucket, Providence, Central Falls, where they have no tree cover. Right. Um, where, you know, I've gone into the neighborhoods with, you know, with a with a thermometer and measured, you can, you can see it's a, it is a 10 to 15 degree difference. You know, go into South Providence, um, you know, and then, you know, measure the temperature on Benefit Street, you know, um, yeah, 10 or 15 degree difference. So I think that's, that's going to become a, a bigger issue too. And tremendous health impacts for folks who, sure. you know, if they can't afford the air conditioning and they have other health conditions exactly. that they're facing at the same time, and then, you know, maybe having trouble affording medicines or yeah. whatever the, you know, maybe transportation issues that kind of yeah. compounds itself. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If you don't have, you don't have air conditioning at home, so you don't have a car. So you've got to, you've got to walk through a street, down a street with no trees. You've got to wait for a bus uh, with no, with no right. shade. 
your say you're next to 95 and there's <clears throat> particulate matter being belched out from the cars going by, I mean, yeah, it's, it's going to have an impact. Right, right. Um, so Rhode Islanders are, are famous for not crossing bridges. And, but, you know, I, the, the birds and the butterflies, they're not going to stop at, at the state line and say, you know, whoa, 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 we're crossing into Massachusetts here. Um, and so I, I, I wonder sometimes, can we even really look at environmental issues from a Rhode Island perspective or just do we need to take a much broader view? Uh, like yes and no, I guess. Um, so there are certain issues, obviously, if anytime you're writing about climate change, it's not unique to Rhode Island, but, you know, there are certain, so, you know, you can write about Rhode Island specific things, you know, coastal erosion. Um, but obviously you have to, you know, put it in the larger context. It was the same thing when I wrote about, you know, the winter flounder or, um, you know, salt marsh sparrows, which are this little bird that nests on the, on the salt marsh and the high marsh, they nest between the highest, um, you know, tides and as sea level, sea level rising, it's, it's crunching the window in which they can lay their eggs. And so, you know, all their young are essentially dying I and mean, that the bird's on its way to extinction. So that's a, it's a bird that's found all up and down the, the coast. Um, but there are particular efforts here to, to try to save it. So yeah, you write about that, you put it in the larger context. I think though that like there are things, I don't think there's any problem just focusing on local things, especially when you're celebrating, you know, um, you know, conservation efforts or conservation victories, right? Right. Um, you know, uh, Catherine Beauchamp's here today, I saw her earlier. I mean, think about, you know, what's been done, you know, uh, up at the Doug Rayner Preserve to, to um, save the Diamondback Terrapins. Right. I mean, incredible efforts, you know, and you've got, you know, what is right the only viable population of the of the terrapin in the state um you think about what people are doing on block island the american bearing beetle which is you know it's an incredible beetle and i would encourage you guys if you're interested look up a story i've written about them but it's a it's a beetle and you know if you're creeped out by insects it's kind of a creepy looking insect but and and they <laughs> and they and they feed on you know they feed on carrion um but they're super, super fascinating. I mean, you know, Jane Goodall devoted a chapter to the American Bearing Beetle in one of her books because they're like such great parents. Um, no, I'm serious. It's, 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 ama it's amazing. <laughs> they're amazing. You know, they're amazing beetles. And, you know, again, we have pretty much the only, you know, viable population of the beetle in, in the country. Um, so... I think those things, you know, those local efforts, people that are that are doing these things, you know, they're not doing it. They're not getting paid for it. They're they're not, you know, they're not doing it for the attention. But I think to celebrate those things, and those are uniquely Rhode Island things. Then, yeah. Right. I, yeah. I, 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 we've got the big blue bug, <laughs> and then we've got the beetle. Yeah, totally. And we've got the right. terrapins. Right. right. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah. great. We got lots of other things. We too. got. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the efforts to save the the New England cottontail, like yeah. you know, right. Um, hey, we've got the world milkweed at St. Andrew's we Farm, do. right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all these great things. So, um, just before we hand it off to everyone else to ask questions, um, well, what are the issues that you see rising to the top of your inbox in in the next couple of years? I mean, obviously, there are going to be issues like sea level rise that will be of special concern to Rhode Islanders. But is there anything that you see coming down the pike that you think you're going to be spending a lot of time on? Uh, I think there's going to be much more to do with renewable energy, um, much more because, it's, you know, we have to, you know, we have to ramp up renewables in order to meet the goals of the act on climate. Um, and those are mandates that are required by law. So we have to meet those targets. And in order to do that, we need more renewables. So I think we're going to see more with that. Um, you know, I, for myself personally, I have, you know, I, there's more stories on environmental justice that I'd like to focus on. Um, and, you know, I hate, I hate harping on about it, but I mean, this thing, you know, it's just in my mind right now about the downpours after the summer, like inland flooding, um, you know, I think of that we're going to see, we're going to see more of that. And, and it's going to be, it brings up these questions about land use and yeah. How do you, how do you prevent that? Like, yeah, I don't know. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I do think that the inland flooding is a very interesting story because we uh, sea level rise and climate change are two words that almost seem to always go hand in hand mm -hmm. and, and they, they belong in the same conversation. But in, inland flooding feels like it needs to yeah. be part of that same Definitely. that same language yeah. uh, and and it's affecting different populations it is. Um, so we're going to turn it out to you guys and just to kind of let you know how we're going to do this because we we have some some viewers out in tv land um i'm going to have you um present your questions and if you can um just say them loudly and you know briefly tell me what your question is and i'm going to repeat it because whoever is watching on Zoom or, or later on YouTube won't be able to hear you when you're speaking. So, um, but we want to have your questions. So just uh, raise your hand and, and share your questions and uh, I'll repeat them. Yes. Do you have any understanding or explanation for the reason that uh, solar panels are not being put on top of large buildings or on parking lots? which serves our forest, right. it's dead space, yeah. and then you'll have cars that are underneath the shade. Okay, so I'm going to try to repeat that. Why don't we have solar panels on top of buildings and garages and other places, which is dead space? Um, did I capture that well enough? Parking lots. Parking lots. Yeah. Why don't we have that? Uh, so rooftops, uh, well, when you have older buildings, there is some question of if you have uh, have to do sort of make improvements to the roof, perhaps that's one of the things that comes up. There are some really big rooftop projects though that are have been built or are, are in development right now. So that, that is something. Parking lots, it's a liability issue, I've, I've been told, um, that developers who want to build over parking lots, that there's, there's, there's insurance that they need to get that ramps up the cost. It's also just more expensive to build those canopies. Um, I've seen them in Texas and, and you know, places that are out west, and I wonder if, you know, just because they do get more sunlight there, so you're increasing the efficiency of the solar panels there, so you can you're getting more energy and thereby, you know, um, you know, generating more revenue if it's more, if it's just worth it there and it's not here. I mean, I've only seen, there are a couple places like the Public Utilities Division uh, or Public Utilities Commission in, um, in Warwick, they have one there. It's not really big, but they have one. Um, but really what it comes down to is that it's just a lot cheaper to develop in green spaces, in forests, um, farmland, it's just a lot cheaper. And unless you build the incentives in, unless you give the developers um, some sort of a bonus payment or something that makes it worth their while to develop in industrial spaces, they're just, they're gonna keep going to green spaces. Yeah, uh, other questions, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So the question is, what is the interaction between the state and the towns uh, in terms of uh, understanding policy, giving them direction, you know, making making it, things happen on solar energy and when? So there, there was, there's a lot of frustration at the local level with what's been happening in the state when it comes particularly to solar. Um, and this started, you know, you can go back six or seven years when um, cities and towns started complaining about, you know, the developers coming in and, and, you know, town planners were telling the state, telling the Office of Energy Resources, that they didn't have the expertise to to you know guide this development, so they they just didn't know. Um, so the state convened sort of a working group that had developers, that had environmental groups, that had you know other stakeholders, um, and they were supposed to work out solar siding guidelines. Um, and it just didn't really happen. So then cities and towns took the matter into their own hands, and a lot of them put in place moratoriums. 
Um, some of them, you know, put in regs that um, were so strict that it essentially banned solar in the towns. Um, and, you know, other places, they, they worked out, you know, uh, agreements with developers. This past General Assembly session, um, the, so legislators finally approved um, guidelines. It's essentially, well, it's, it's, it's the, so the legislation bans uh, solar developers, or effectively bans solar development in uh, places that are defined as core forest. So it's trying to keep um, the projects out of big tracts of forest land. Um, and that covers quite a large percentage of the state, but there are still other areas where they're allowing these things. Um, the program, like solar development is largely driven by an incentive called net metering, which pays developers an inflated rate for their power. If uh, if you were to get rid of, you know, that program, I think, you know, it could it could change the, the landscape a lot. Um, I mean, there are other programs that pay the developers, you know, great money too. It's just that one is so, so good. Um, and that's what's been driving a lot of the development. But I mean, it is being phased. That, that is being phased out. It's just that it's, it's still there right now. So, so, okay, so your question relates to when you've installed solar panels on your home and then you end up with some credits, but you're unable to utilize those to offset your bill and and that your only choices then are to donate them to a nonprofit or, you know, you're looking for what can be done to make that more effective for the homeowner. Okay, so when you said Massachusetts buys the credits from you, um, I'm not sure if you. So this this issue came up in term in, in the legislature too this year. So they they raised the cap on the size of a of a array that you could put on the capacity of an array that you could put on your house, and when you're that excess energy now, um, you should be able to sell back to the grid, but it's at a lower rate. So you'd be getting a net metering rate on your household system. It, when you sell back the excess, it would be sold back at a wholesale rate. So that's lower, but you'd still be generating income off that. I don't know if like, you know, because you put your, your system in before that law was changed, if it wouldn't apply to you, I, I'm not sure. But I know this issue has come up too. Because again, if you're, if you've got a, if you've got lots of roof space, like you should be able to maximize the size of, of, of the system you put in. I mean, why not? Right. Um, another question. Mm -hmm. So they're not something that we really need. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, I was just so absorbed. Yeah. Uh, so it, she was asking about floating wind turbines. Um, so they're not something that we we will see down here. I don't think because uh, because of the outer continental shelf we have relatively shallow waters that go pretty far offshore. Um, so they're talking about them in Maine. I mean, that's where they're experimenting with the University of Maine is experimenting with them. I think they're experimenting with them off maybe the coast of Scotland. Um, maybe, I mean, the, the talk when I had heard about them before is if you want to develop offshore wind on the West Coast, you'd have to look at floating turbines. Um, and I mean, I, you know, I guess the technology is there, but it's still in sort of the testing stage. Yeah. Yeah. It's this leads to a question that was submitted uh, at registration um, by Allison Walsh. Is Allison here? No. Okay. Um, she said that um, that she had read in national accounts that Rhode Island very soon 
will not be a leader in wind power turbines despite our early entrance. Is that accurate? And if so, what are the conditions leading toward that outcome? Um, I mean, where, even though we're sort of like early movers, um, we're a very small part of the market um, where, you know, I think developers will tell you, companies involved in the business will tell you that, you know, Rhode Island is ideally, ideally situated. So um, that's why where, you know, we do have development. We, we not only have um, uh, wind farms being built off the coast, but we also have, you know, some, you know, manufacturing here. So there's a facility in the Port of Providence where they're um, fabricating some offshore wind components, components for the wind farm. So internal platforms that go inside um, the, the turbine towers, um, platforms that they bolt onto the side, you know, they're doing some other work. Um, but, you know, we're not like the big manufacturing, like manufacturing wind turbines themselves or blades, that's all happening in Europe right now. We haven't seen that here yet. Um, and I think if you're looking at where I mean, we're we're gonna see we're gonna see a ton of development here over the next ten years, but then, you know, you're also gonna see lots of development in New York, you know, New Jersey, you know, even further down the coast. So, um, it's not all gonna happen here, but that doesn't mean that you know it excludes Rhode Island. It just means that you know, I mean, if you talk to the developers, they'll tell you that there's 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 not going to be one port or one place that's going to benefit from this like in, in europe there's this huge port in germany called bremerhaven and like the the you know 15 years ago when we were first talking about offshore wind here in rhode island you know everyone was like oh could we turn rhode island into this you know the u.s equivalent and the developers found out that no it's not going to happen because you know, Quant is not big enough, Port Providence isn't big enough, but even if you go down the coast, New London isn't big enough, um, the, you know, New Bedford isn't big enough. So you just, you have some in each port, like everyone benefits. Right. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, yeah. I, I read his article. Oh, right. There you go. <laughs> so the question is, how, how do you keep yourself educated, informed, and on top of everything? So I'm, I'm reading like other people that are reporting on this stuff too, right? Like the national publications. Um, and then talking to a lot of uh, people that specialize in, in this stuff, like the scientists. You know, we have we have a, a world-renowned oceanography school, you know, at URI. So, you know, I talk to people there folks at Brown that are studying this stuff. Um, and then, you know, uh, the regulators, like the, the DEM, the Department of Environmental Management, I think in some quarters they, they get a bad rap, you know, because people feel like they're understaffed, they're not doing enough. But the people that are there, the people that are there, DEM, people at the Coastal Resources Management Council, which again is like, we write so many negative stories about the CRMC because, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, shenanigans going on there but the staff that work there they're they're experts in their field and, you know so yeah i talked to them too yeah and, and uh let's see i'm gonna go to you next yes oh yeah yeah Horrible. 
Okay, so I, I, I want to just repeat, I'm going to shorten that up and repeat the question. Um, so I, the, the question is, um, why hasn't more been done in terms of the inside of the Rhode Island Resource Recovery uh, Facility? Um, because she says the conditions are deplorable and also what's being done about the Johnson landfill and concern about it being covered with um, with artificial turf. So I haven't heard that. <clears throat> I haven't heard that, uh, the artificial turf. That's, is there? <laughs> I'll have to look it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to look it up, okay. I'll, I'll, yeah. look, I'll look it up then, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, um, yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Also, the cost, too. It seems like that would be very expensive. So, yeah, and you could so you can do that with with closed landfills, right? You can cover them with solar panels um, if they're capped. And this is another thing that people always ask about is why aren't all these, you know, because we used to, before we had the central landfill, you know, each city and town had their own landfill. So they're all over the place. Um, you can go to East Providence, Forbes Street. They have a, a huge solar array there. Um, but it was a lot of work to get it done because, again, it's the sort of the, 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 the liability issues. You, you, you can't put... So usually when you when you mount a solar panel on the ground, like you're essentially you're putting like a pole into the ground, it's mounted on there. But when on a landfill, you can't do that. You have to rest them, essentially rest them on top. Um, and so then you and you've got to make sure the landfill is capped properly. You can't you can't put a break that cap. There are all sorts of things you got to do. Um, but yeah, in the future, once we close the landfill, put, put solar panels on there. It makes sense. I'm going to go to one other question we had uh, submitted ahead of time. Um, uh, Lydia Bredemeyer was cons is concerned about stormwater runoff watersheds and water quality. What are your thoughts on how we can keep our resources clean? There's a softball for you. Right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, obviously, like with Narragansett Bay, like this is this is a huge issue for us. Um, you know, we've seen we've seen the bay. It's uh, water quality. The the bay's cleaned up. It's gotten so much cleaner over the past you know couple decades. Um, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the CSO tunnel that was built under Providence. There's a second tunnel that's being built under um, uh, Pawtucket right now. And you know. Uh, <sighs> I think everyone thought, you know, you build those tunnels, it's going to take care of the worst stormwater, and um, it sort of solves the problem. But again, this is this is this issue with climate change and big downpours. It, right. You know, the there's so much rain um, that even these tunnels are mass, are massive. You know, like one and a half miles long, like 20, 30 feet in diameter. Um, the storm. Uh, you know, Labor Day of last year, it filled up the CSO tunnel in Providence in one hour, right? Um, so, so after that, and that's combined. This combined overflow. So that's a that's a system that's it's it's uh, that's an antiquated design. This happens in older cities, where you have a sewage system where the storm uh, storm drains flow into that system. If flow is too great, you have these essentially check valves and that combined flow. So raw sewage mixed with stormwater exits straight into the bay. Um, and that's why, you know, with these big rainstorm events, you know, they close down all the shellfish beds in the upper bay. Um, now the stormwater tunnel, CSO tunnel was designed to prevent things like that from happening. But again, if you get these extreme downpours, then it's not, that's not gonna happen. The bay eventually flushes out, um, but you know, if it happens, you know, too often then it can you know lead to all sorts of other issues right yeah. so it's so a work in progress yeah. one last question and and uh yeah Right. 
So the question is, how do you preserve your sense of hope in the face of all the things that you're covering and, and keep your, your sanity and your sense of optimism? I think by focusing on those, again, like the local, you know, success stories that, that we're seeing here. And I see a lot of them, you know. Um, they, you know, we have, we have a sort of loons, right? The bird, the, you know, the beautiful birds, right? Um, they all but disappeared from, from, you know, this part of the country. And um, there's like, there was a breeding pair that was discovered um, in Fall River two years ago, I guess. Um, and, you know, just going out and spending time with people who are trying to help the loons. I mean, it's, it's cool. Like the spade foot, there's a colony of spade foot toads and, and, you know, down in Richmond. And, you know, I was down there with like, I don't know how many people who were trying to like help the spade foot toad. I mean, like, it's just things like that. Like you can't help but be positive when, when you're, when you're seeing things like that. Um, and, yeah. you know and, and I'll, I'll follow that by saying when I when I look and see some of the young people who are involved in projects you know the students we've got working on stewardship projects and I feel like there's a lot of hope in the next generation for um, you know them being the improved model and and, uh, and and growing up with an awareness and a sense of responsibility yeah and to build on that I mean like you know I see a lot of you know, climate activism among the younger generation, like really, really, you know, they, they see that this is the world they're going to inherit. And there are a lot of younger people that are really, really active. So that gives me a ton of hope too. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a great note to end on. Yeah. And Alex, thank you for making time to be with yeah. us. Thank you. And, uh, and, and thank all of you for coming uh, and participating. And uh, we'll see you uh, hopefully, um, we'll hopefully see you in October, October 3rd and 4th. We have a filmmaker coming. Um, he is sort of the Indiana Jones of the environmental documentary uh, and has gone to some pretty extreme places. And uh, so we hope to come back for that. And thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.